According to the British papers, who dissected Barry Prudhomme's life following his 17-day bloody stint as a fugitive in 1982, Prudhomme had an unremarkable youth that was punctuated with bouts of criminal mischief that, more often than not, landed the youngster in trouble. Born in Leeds in 1944, Prudhomme was the result of an illicit and short-lived affair between a dressmaker and a soldier. Prudhomme's father abandoned the pair shortly after his birth and was never heard from again by Barry. Although Prudhomme had infrequent run-ins with the law during his childhood, including one notable time he was caught breaking into someone's home, he was able to secure an apprenticeship as an electrician soon after leaving school, a career he reportedly showed some promise in. However, Prudhomme's real passions were guns and the military, and it's reported that he consumed media relating to both of these subjects with an obsessive level of fanaticism. This culminated in Prudhomme joining in 1969 a voluntary reserve unit of the Special Air Service, the sister unit of the legendary but somewhat lesser known Special Boat Service, which as we previously covered had something of an interesting start. You can see our video Roger caught me in a watery gamble for more on that one. Exactly how much Prudhomme learned during his time with the SAS isn't clear because of how notoriously secretive the service is and because of conflicting reports from the time. While some sources state that Prudhomme was summarily dismissed for lack of discipline, others describe that he was committed enough to make it to the final test, barely failing to become a fully-fledged member of the famously well-trained and elite fighting force. Another reason there's confusion over how much Prudhomme learned during his time with the SAS and how much was learned on his own is that later raids of his home found a well-thumbed copy of No Need to Die, a Bible of survival techniques written by survival expert, former SAS instructor, and former paratrooper Eddie McGee. It would also be later revealed that Prudhomme attended at least one course held by McGee on the subject of living off the land. After his failure to make it into the SAS reserves, Prudhomme settled down somewhat and earned a respectable living working on oil fields in the Middle East to support his growing family. However, this all came to an abrupt end in 1977 when he returned home to find out that his wife had left him for another man. On top of that, there was the unexpected drowning of his mother a few years earlier, which is thought to have been another catalyst to his apparent mental breakdown. After divorcing his wife, Prudhomme became a violent, swaggering bully who traveled across the US and Canada with his new girlfriend, taking work when and where he could. It was during this time in the US that Prudhomme was able to get his hands on a gun, which he was inexplicably then able to smuggle back to England somehow in the 1980s. In January 1982, Prudhomme was arrested for nearly beating a man to death with an iron bar in his hometown of Leeds. However, prior to being tried, he posted bail and absconded. It's from here that the subject matter gets a little bit more disturbing. A few months after jumping bail on the 17th of June, Prudhomme was laying low on the outskirts of Leeds when police constable David Hay, who'd originally set out to deliver a simple summons to a poacher, came across him. What exactly transpired isn't known, but a few hours later, PC Hay was found by his colleagues lying dead by the open door of his car, felled by a single bullet to the head. Investigating officers examining the scene found a clipboard next to Hay's body on which a car's registration details and a name were written. Both leads quickly turned cold as the car was later found burned out in a field and was reportedly bought in London a few months earlier for cash. The name on the clipboard, also Clive Jones, turned out to be a fake. Three days after killing the police officer, Prudhomme had made his way to Lincolnshire, where he broke into the home of an elderly woman and stole the total of £4.50 from her purse. Though shaken, the woman survived with no real injuries. This sadly can't be said for the elderly couple who owns the next home Prudhomme crashed three days later. After tying up and robbing the terrified couple, Prudhomme shot both of them in the head. While the 52-year-old husband died instantly from his wound, his 50-year-old wife miraculously survived, although she suffered from brain damage and was unable to recollect the horrifying encounter. Prudhomme's spree continued, and over the next few days, he injured a dog police handler called Ken Oliver and a third officer called David Winter. In case your opinion of Prudhomme at this point wasn't low enough, he also shot Ken Oliver's dog, which, despite it being hit twice, made a full and fuzzy recovery. But here's the part that made Prudhomme's story so terrifying for the public. After the attempted murder of PC Oliver and his dog, Prudhomme fled into the woods, which within an hour were flooded with over a thousand police officers, and yet somehow Prudhomme was able to escape. The impossible escape it paralyzed the populace of the local area with fear, and for several days afterwards, many people in the region stayed blockaded in their homes. It's reported that some people even left their keys in their cars so Prudhomme could just take them without incident. Four days after evading capture, Prudhomme killed PC Winters after being stopped for routine questioning. Again, despite hundreds of officers descending on the area, he managed to slip away undetected.
Sometime between the attempted murder of PC Oliver and the murder of PC Winters, Prudhomme had been identified as the murderer and officially named as the subject of what was, at the time, the single largest armed manhunt in British history. This was made possible thanks to a slip-up on behalf of Prudhomme. You see, although it had given PC Hay a false name, it had given the officer his real date of birth, which had been subsequently noted down on his clipboard, and it was this vital lead which allowed officers to make the connection between Prudhomme and the string of crimes that he had committed. After learning Prudhomme's true identity and learning about his military training and obsession with survival tactics, the police knew they were in over their heads and decided to reach out to someone they knew Prudhomme couldn't hide from. Eddie McGee, the guy who literally wrote the book on survival that Prudhomme was using to evade the police. McGee, who had sons serving as police officers in the area, readily agreed to lend his skills to the police. The police then deployed even more officers on the scene surrounding the town of Moulton, the last place that had been seen. Little did the police know, Prudhomme was literally yards away from the local police station, watching images of himself on a television in the home of an elderly man called Brian Johnson that had taken hostage. Through these television reports, Prudhomme learns that McGee was trying to track him and that the police were searching for him in a local wood. What Prudhomme didn't know is that the police had been intentionally feeding the media false reports to make him underestimate the size of the force hunting him, as well as muddy his idea about where their efforts were focused. Upon leaving Johnson's house, Prudhomme carefully laid out a false trail to confuse McGee and took refuge under a piece of plastic sheeting. After Brian Johnson managed to free himself, he contacted the police and McGee began investigating the scene. He quickly saw through the false trail that Prudhomme had laid and was able to track him to his correct location, sneaking up behind him and stealthily putting a hand on his leg to confirm he was there before sneaking off again. After retreating, McGee informed the hundreds of officers gathered that had found their man, only to hear the unmistakable sound of a gun shot. The police answered with a volley of their own, and after silence fell, they went to check on Prudhomme's location, where they found him lying dead. After a brief investigation, it was discerned that Prudhomme had died by his own hands, though he had several pieces of shotgun buckshot in his body as well. It was a bloody end to 17 days of fear that had gripped the nation. And now for some bonus facts. To join either the SAS or the SBS, you have to pass an infamously brutal and unforgiving selection process, which involves a month of grueling physical exercise, culminating in a 40-kilometer march across the harshest terrain that Britain has to offer. There's also nine weeks of training in the jungle, 14 weeks of training in demolitions, reconnaissance, and a variety of other advanced combat tactics. The process then culminates in something known as survive, evade, resist, extract training, which involves releasing the recruits into the woods where they are hunted down by raw marines who will then interrogate them for several weeks using sleep, food, water, and sensory deprivation. If a recruit fails during any one of these, or gives any answer other than their name, rank, date of birth, or army number during the interrogation process, they fail. Additionally, recruits hoping to join the SBS are required to undertake several more months of water-based training, which involves learning how to do such amazing things as infiltrating and exiting submarines while they are submerged, and diving out of planes into freezing cold water in near-zero visibility. Recruits hoping to join the SBS or SAS can only apply a maximum of two times before they're barred from ever trying again. Unsurprisingly, over 90% of recruits who apply for the SBS or SAS fail. Incidentally, the official motto of the SBS is By Strength and Guile, which contrasts quite starkly with the motto of their sister unit, which is simply Who Dares Wins. The SBS and SAS work in alternative six-month-long shifts, during which they will train constantly to keep their skills as sharp as possible. These training sessions are understandably rather secretive, but are known to involve live-fire training exercises and mock raids on potential terrorist targets to test their security. In one such mock raid, members of the SBS broke into a nuclear power plant in Scotland in less than a minute, exposing various issues with security at that plant. In regards to live-fire training exercises, both the SBS and SAS are said to always train using live ammo and often use real people as hostages. The SAS in particular is known to invite foreign dignitaries to take part in these exercises to demonstrate their skill and composure. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. When you're subscribing, you should also hit that bell icon so you find out when we put out a new video. Also, why not check out my new channel? It's called Highlight History. It's sort of a today in history thing. If you like this channel, you'll like that as well, I promise. And as always, thank you for watching.